I'm Jody Freeman. Uh, I'm a professor here at uh, the law school. And I am really excited about this panel. I've been looking forward to it. Um, I ran this morning into uh, a woman from the class of 1958 coming up from the parking lot whose name is Adele Simmons. And I don't know if she's in the room, but it was kind of an auspicious thing to happen to run into somebody from one of these early classes. This is, in fact, the first class of women to graduate from Harvard Law School. And we found this photo in the archives and thought it was a good backdrop for the panel. Um, it's a very interesting moment for a panel focused on women in law and women in leadership uh, positions. Uh, you know, we've just witnessed the first woman Democratic nominee uh, lose to another candidate who publicly uh, bragged about sexually assaulting women and made many public statements, as we all know, uh, demeaning women. A very interesting moment in American politics. Um, there's also no shortage of media attention at the moment on a kind of revived moment of sexual harassment as a result of the Harvey Weinstein uh, revelations and then of course all the revelations at Fox News about sexual harassment and then even the Google memo about whether women are equal to the job of being an engineer. We sort of have had uh, an abundance of um, issues arise, and here comes Amy's name tag, recently that I think have put this question of women in professional life uh, and how they're treated and how they're treated in public life back into the conversation with, a real, uh, with real energy. And so it's a particularly nice moment to host uh, our four panelists at the law school to talk about women in law and women in leadership uh, and beyond. Somebody said to me, you know, do you, why are we having this panel? Because there's so many women who are wildly accomplished graduates of Harvard Law School uh, and other leading law schools who are out in the world uh, in the Senate and in, at every level of government and as CEOs and in every kind of leadership position in law firms. And so why do you need a panel on women uh, in law? And uh, I think the consensus view was it was still a very worthwhile panel to have, notwithstanding that we have very accomplished women sprinkled throughout the bicentennial celebration. Because here we can really ask a set of questions in a very focused way about what the experience has been for you guys and uh, how you might give some advice to the generation coming up. So let me introduce um, our very distinguished panel. Uh, let me start with Lori. Uh, Lori Lesser is a partner at Simpson Thatcher and Bartlett in New York. She is the head of the intellectual property transactions practice and co-chair of the privacy and cybersecurity practice at the firm. She has been cited in every top lawyer, best of, uh, leading winner of every award. I could list them. It would take a very long time, but suffice it to say that she is absolutely at the top of her field. Uh, she has represented a long list of uh, major companies, uh, including Google, Microsoft, Viacom, Virgin, Mobile, Warner Music, and many private equity firms, including Warburg Pincus, Lion Capital, Silver Lake, Vestra, I could go on. Her list of clients is um, very distinguished. Um, and she has a wonderful affiliation with the law school, and we're just delighted that you could come back uh, and share your experience in practice with us. Uh, Nadine Strasser is also with us, another distinguished alum. Nadine is currently the John Marshall Harlan uh, Professor of Law at New York Law School. But Nadine served from 1991 to 2008 as the first woman president of the ACLU uh, and uh, is currently working on a book mm -hmm. called Hate, Why We Should Resist It With Free Speech, Not Censorship, which is coming out shortly, I understand, in the spring yes. sometime. Uh, so we'll look forward to that. And um, Nadine, too, has won many, many awards uh, for her leadership. Uh, in the civil rights movement and as a, a lawyer at the top of her profession uh, and of course um, has a, a nice long affiliation with the law school and we call on you often and you've been back to many reunions so thank you for joining us. Amy Bach uh, is here. She is really, I think of you as an entrepreneur, Amy. Amy invented Measures for Justice, which is an organization that monitors how the criminal justice system is doing. Is that fair to say? And she invented the metrics by which we do that. Um, she founded Measures for Justice in 2011, um, following the success of her wonderful book, Ordinary Justice, How America Holds Court, which won the Robert F. Kennedy Book Award. She's been named a, a Draper Richards Kaplan Social Entrepreneur 
Um, and while she is not a graduate of this law school, we will forgive you for the moment uh, because you are such an entrepreneur. And finally, um, the youngest member of our panel, Ali Colesteel, who graduated from Harvard Law School just a few years ago uh, and was a student of mine and was in our Women in Ambition class, which was an experiment that we, uh, uh, we did here at the law school to talk about these issues. Uh, before she went to law school, uh, Allie worked in democratic politics for several years. She worked on Barack Obama's 2008 campaign. After law school, she worked on Hillary Clinton's campaign in Brooklyn headquarters uh, on the legal team, and she is currently at Boys Schiller. So we thought we'd have a little age diversity. We were to be joined as well by Danielle Gray, who many of you may know uh, was a leading official in the Obama White House and uh, held very senior positions there, but uh, she's in a depot, and it just won't end. So, uh, so she won't be with us. But what I would like to do is actually invite you guys to ask questions fairly early into this. If you'll just let me get a few out to the panel, get us started, um, then I think making it a kind of interactive session would be, uh, would be really fun. Uh, I just want to cite a few points about HLS history uh, with women. 1950 was the year the first women were admitted to the law school class. Uh, we were not the first law school to admit women. Uh, Columbia and Yale had admitted women uh, before us. Um, once the early group of women came through the law school, it's very well known that that was not the end of the challenges, but the beginning. Many law firms did not hire women. Sandra Day O'Connor, the first woman Supreme Court Justice, always used to remind uh, people of the difficulty she had after graduating from Stanford Law School getting a job because law firms wouldn't hire women and she had to go into a county uh, prosecutor's office, a county role uh, in government because she couldn't get hired. Um, the other little fun facts that I had to remind myself about, it wasn't until 1972 that the first woman professor was tenured at the law school and that was followed by the tenuring of Martha Field, Betsy Bartholet, Susan Estrich, Marianne Glendon and Martha Minow, all of whom but Susan Estrich are still on this faculty which means it was not that long ago that this happened. Uh, and in fact, Martha Minow was my mentor when I was at Harvard Law School and is one of the reasons that I managed to find my way here again. The first woman to head the Harvard Law Review, 1977. The first woman dean, Elena Kagan, in 2003. Yeah, I mean, that's late. Uh, the second woman dean, Martha Minow, came quickly on her heels. Uh, and the first JD class at Harvard Law School to be 50% women, 2014. So, right? So it's a little surprising. Um, so let me just first turn to you guys and ask you about this uh, experience you've had. I'll sit down. Um, the experience you've had in your careers and how, how law school here at Harvard or Amy elsewhere prepared you for your careers and what it was like leaving law school and going into your careers. If you could just give me a bit of reflection on that experience. Lori. I'll start. Um, I mean, I would say I, I think it's been an enormously valuable credential. I would like to believe, you know, there's equality on paper and there's equality in fact. And on paper, we all deserve to be treated equally in the workplace. But, but in fact, that's not always the case. And I think it is really a tremendous credential that I think gives you an aura and the benefit of a doubt when you walk in the room. I mean, of course, you will be judged, you hope, mo mainly on your own accomplishments, but I do find there have been situations where I, I think you have the benefit of the doubt to be taken seriously by having it, and so I think it really is a credential that, that everyone should treasure, and I think it's been incredibly valuable to me in my career. I mean, obviously, there are other good law schools out there that would do the same, but, but I can think of so many times where either someone has actually said something or I can tell by the way I've been treated, you know, what an advantage it has been to have this degree. In no order particular, Nadine. I was just, I wrote down 2003 because you said that was so recent to have the first woman dean of the Harvard Law School, but Yale, not to be competitive, uh, just named its first woman dean this year in 2017. So, it's still shocking to me after all of these years that we're still having to count and to keep track. I and my classmates thought we would be 
uh, hoped we would be long past this time. That said, as an activist, I, I always see the glass full, half full rather than half empty, and uh, there have been such enormous strides since the days that I was at Harvard. I went here for seven years as an undergraduate and law student, and in that entire seven years, I had not a single female instructor. Uh, I, I mean, I really marvel at, and the law school was about 10% women at the time. Uh, the college was was fixed at 25% women, because that was before the equal admissions. I, I graduated with an armband um, demonstrating for, or advocating for equal admissions. So I always like to brag the women, of course, were better than the men, because we were, we were by definition, a more uh, highly selected group. But it was kind of a lonely experience. The positive aspect of it was that we really mentored each other. We had a very, very strong women's law association headed by one of my classmates who sadly died within the last year, a, a fabulous um, uh, alumna, Sadell Patas. Many of you may have known her. And I think, you know, we nurtured each other and encouraged each other. And in fact, the women in our law school class take vacations together go on cruises together. So that was the upside of being this tiny, embattled little group. And I have to say something positive about the men in our class, because I married one of them. And <laughs> it was the, of all the wonderful aspects of Harvard Law School, and I agree with Lori, it, was, it actually was a wonderful education, as substantively, as well as uh, a wonderful uh, credential. But uh, absolutely dwarfing that is having found a great life partner. <laughs> and uh, let me ask you, if, could you guys just give us a sense of how you came to your careers? Just a little bit of background, because I, I think there are a lot of, we have one L's and two L's, and we have law students here in the audience who kind of, I think will want to know how you became who you are and how you got there. And I just, I wonder if you could reflect on whether it was all planned or it, 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 it seemed somewhat fortuitous and just give us a sense, maybe, Amy, I mean, how did you come to create an organization nobody had thought about? Well, okay, I didn't go to Harvard Law School, okay, but um, I went to this other one on the West Coast, okay, <laughs> called Stanford, and, uh, but I was a fellow here in the Human Rights uh, Center for a bit when I was writing my book. So basically, I went to law school and I clerked for um, an appellate judge in Miami, a uh, federal appellate judge. And, I, and after my clerkship, I wrote like this little uh, article in the Nation magazine about voting rights, which was something that I saw in one of the states that the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the jurisdiction covered in Alabama. And that story ended up getting picked up like everywhere, like it was the only story I've ever written. I was a journalist before law school that got picked up by People Magazine, and so, uh, and so the nation gave me a year to write about civil rights, and talk about a credit card. I mean, they're, one of the reasons why they're willing to do that is not only because the story got picked up, but because I had the credential of going to a prestigious law school, and it was, it's a, it is, it's, a, it's like a, it's a, it's a credit card, it says, um, and when people, when you're talking and you're interviewing people, they say, well, who are you? Are you a lawyer? And you say, yes, I am. And they say, well, where'd you go to law school? And, uh, and so anyway, so a after that, I, um, uh, the conclusion of this book that I, I, that, that I wrote, uh, based on my fellowship at The Nation, said, you've got to figure out a way to measure uh, criminal justice on the county level because that's where justice happens. I mean, if I asked you where you went to school, you know, when you went to high school, and if I said, well, w how does that school compare to other high schools, you would know uh, based on teacher-student ratios, college admission rates, you would know that. And if I said, you know, where's the good hospital around here, you could tell me probably by specialty in Boston where, I mean, because we have all sorts of measures, but there weren't any measures for local criminal justice. Um, and so, uh, the conclusion of this book I wrote uh, said, why don't we do this? And then I was incredibly fortunate that um, I, uh, I wrote about that as well in an op-ed, and it was in the New York Times, and I was sitting at my desk one day, and someone called me and was like, I think this is a really brilliant idea. I represent a donor. If, would you ever think of doing this? And I said, well, I've been thinking about doing this, and I uh, ended up... 
applying to this donor and winning this thing called Echoing Green and getting some seed funding and founded Measures for Justice. And it's, you know, we started with nothing. Now we have 23 employees in upstate New York and Rochester. We're funded by, you know, MacArthur and Ford and um, Chan Zuckerberg, which is Mark Zuckerberg's and Pershing Square and all of these people. And it really all started with this seed of the law. But I mean, it, it took like an expansive leap, but it, would all, it all was founded in this, um, in, 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 you know, a, the, it was right after law school, really. And Ali, your experience both before and just after now, um, whether you're already seeing that a law degree it makes a big difference for you and whether you're experiencing something, being a woman, young woman starting out in law that maybe you didn't anticipate, just curious about how it's gone so far. Yeah, I mean, I'm probably just beginning to see the ways my law degree will pay off over my career. But one thing that struck me was, um, as you were mentioning about the history of the law school, I was reflecting on the fact that my first semester of my 1L year here was Celebration 60, where everyone came to law school, many of you I'm sure were here, and it was celebrating 60 years of women at Harvard Law, and here we are just a few years later celebrating 200 years of Harvard Law School, and I think in the news a lot lately, um, the term imposter syndrome has been talked about a lot, just this feeling of that you don't really belong here and what am I doing here? And I think that law, being at law school here really helped get that out of your, my system in a way that has been very helpful being a young female associate at a law firm. I often find myself sitting around a conference room or in a deposition thinking, you know, what, do I, what am I doing here? And I think that was very much a feeling I had at the beginning of, of my 1L year. But over time, you especially in the way the classrooms are run here and the Socratic method, you realize like what I have to say is just as good as what this man sitting across from me has to say. And I think that's served me well already, just feeling like a little bit more empowered to assert myself in, in situations where I might feel a little bit like I don't belong. I, I, I'm wondering if um, now that you, you less so, Ali, but, but everybody been out of pra you know, in practice or in profession for quite a long time now. And if you think back to your law school experience, whether you would have advice for yourself, you know, if you could reflect back on, if you were to tell yourself as a 1L something that would be valuable or even a 2 or 3L, what, what would that be right now? Definitely what I already alluded to, which is being very involved in all of the opportunities for co-curricular activities. Um, and I was involved in Women's Law Association, and I was on the Law Review, and uh, we, I don't know if these organizations still exist, the Prisoners Legal Assistance Project and the Legal Aid Bureau and Harvard Voluntary Defenders. I kid you not, I was doing all of that and being a proctor in Harvard Yard and going to every kind of um, speaking engagement and for all of the wonderful classroom education, those co-curricular activities were absolutely essential, especially at a time when we didn't have much clinical opportunities and experiential opportunities here. It was through the student-run organizations and talk about empowerment. I mean, we were representing clients. We were, and, and without that much supervision from professors or, or, or lawyers at the time, and I, it really has informed how I teach because I really do believe that students and young lawyers will rise to the level of responsibility that, that you put upon them. And I was recently reminded that what really first put the ACLU in my sights was when Ruth Bader Ginsburg spoke here while I was a student. She was then the founding director of the ACLU Women's Rights Project. And it really opened my eyes as she talked about why she chose the ACLU, this general civil liberties organization, as the best basis for advocating women's rights in particular. I, I may well have found it without that, but I, I love that connection. I would say I do both uh, deal work and I do litigation. And, and this piece of advice I would also give to male students, but I do think it disproportionately affects women. I would 
try to have a real soul searching exercise on if you want to be a litigator versus doing a transactional type of law. And that doesn't mean private sector, government, et cetera. Law school is the case method. And that, and because that's what you do in class and it has the drama and it's the way you learn. And by the way, the law school's gotten much more diverse on this. I mean, all the cases were pretty much case method when we were here. And there's a lot more practical things and adjunct professors and, and things they have to get you more familiar with the different ways you can be a lawyer besides being a litigator. I, I think there are a lot of people, men and women, who become litigators just because that's the only thing they know. Or they think, well, I know how to write a brief. I was an English major. I know how to write. You know, I know how to make a decent argument. I was on the debate team. But um, but litigation is hard. I mean, every field is hard. I think litigation is one of the hardest fields that's out there. And this is a whole different conversation. But there's a whole different set of reasons why I do think it's harder for women. And I think if you were born to do it, you should do it. Why? You- why? Why? I think, well, I think there's a couple of things I will say, and, 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 and I've been doing this for a while. I would say there's some cultural issues. I think there is a narrower range of female personality types that are acceptable to judges and juries. I mean, if you have it, that's great. Like what? Uh, it, it's, the, it's the double bind that's in all the media. It's like, you know, you have to be firm. You have to be authoritative. They still have to like you. I mean, my females talk about, my female partners talk about, well, you know, on the jury, I was really scared these female jurors wouldn't like me because they were stay-at-home moms and they were going to think, like, what's this woman doing here not being with their kids? I mean, you never know what the female, I mean, of course, the male jurors may not like the male lawyers, but I do think just anecdotally, there are a separate set of issues. You know, you might need to beat up the witness, but you have to beat up the witness in the exact way that they don't use the B word for you, but you still get the job done. So, so how do you nicely get the witness to admit they've been lying? I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult. There's a lot of travel involved. It's, it's very combative. You have to have the stomach, not just the stomach for it. You have to love it because there are people out there who love it. I mean, it's all the people you hated in high school. A lot of them. You know, I mean, I mean, it's the people who love to fight and be argumentative over everything. And really enjoying a great intellectual appellate level debate in Manning's class is not the same thing as what's going to happen to you in a lot of litigation. And that, that being said, if, if, you know, there are so many women who are great at it and were born to do it. But, and I also think, and, but I think there's generally things about litigation that are not necessarily pleasant for men or for women. So I think that you should really do some soul searching. Is that what you were born to do? Do you love it? You know, think of all the reasons you love it and really test yourself if there's other fields you might also like. Because I do think the numbers of women who, at least in the big firm, which is the world that I live in, the numbers are much better for women outside of litigation. And so, so the, you know, you don't necessarily have to run right through the offensive and defensive line. There are ways to, to get to the top, you know, cutting around to the to the out-of-bounds lines and different other specialties. And just to piggyback off of that, I think what Lori's talking about is really paying attention to what you like and who are you, because I wish I, wish I had said to myself, like I was comparing myself to other people and um, really, uh, you know, my heart would race when I would say something in class. And I look back on that, and what I know now is that you know, ex- exactly what you said. Like, I know as much as anybody else, and even the people who know the most don't really know in some sense. So so to, to run your own race and to pay attention to really what you like, because if you do that, then you won't end up in, this, in a job where you're like, as some of my friends have, just being like, this is so not me. How did I get here? But it's hard to check in when you're sort of comparing yourself. And it seems like there are these people out there in law school, they just seem to know what they want and know who they are and got everything together. And, you know, it, life is long, so it takes a long time to, to get to where you want to be. So just keep on, you know, sort of checking in and thinking about what you like to do. Uh, may I ask, uh, how many people here are law students now? or students now. Okay, so one other piece of advice that I would give, um, which won't necessarily succeed, but it's definitely worth trying, is if you are really interested in a particular field or uh, that a a certain professor is working in or you know that the professor is working on a project that you're interested in, whether you're in that person's class or not, seek him or her out. Uh, I have to tell you, you know, when I started teaching and students did that, my first reaction was, well, why isn't it unfair to hire this person as a research assistant just because she knocked on my door? Shouldn't the due process part of me send out a notice? (laughs) And I thought, no, because what they are showing by doing that is a quality that that I value very much, and that's taking initiative. 
and being an advocate. And I know there's this generalization, I don't know to what extent it's substantiated by evidence, that women are supposedly less assertive on our own behalves. I know I certainly have that problem for myself, so I always see it as an advocacy exercise. Assume that you are advocating for a client and use that same um, degree of assurance and assertiveness that you would use on behalf of a client or a cause. Think of it as the cause of empowering yourself to be an effective advocate for a client. So, you know, I say it won't necessarily work because I did seek out a professor who I'm sure is not teaching here anymore, uh, who was very unhelpful. But you know, <laughs> that, that, that's 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 a good experience too, right? <laughs> I want to ask you some very pointed questions and, and before I throw it open, and they're the hard questions, and you know people don't always want to ask them in polite company, but here they are. Is it really different being a woman still, when hears this, still, you know, in your practice or in your professional world? If it is, what are the biggest challenges that you still face? Uh, have you seen people try things that you really would recommend to overcome some of those challenges, right? And have you seen people try things that are just disastrous that you would strongly recommend women don't do? So can, can I get some yeah. feedback on this? Because I get these kinds of questions yeah. all the time. Are you looking at me, Tony? I don't know why. <laughs> Maybe I'm going to start. I'm going to start with you, but I'd actually like to hear okay. if everybody could. You know, one thing I don't I'm not sure if this counts as yeah, it is a challenge because uh, my female colleagues uh, and I, of various ages and I often comment that we are still often in a situation where we are the only women or one of a tiny number of women. It's really amazing to me. You know, I'll, I, I'll tell you an example from uh, just a couple of years ago. I was speaking at a, like a three-day conference on national security issues, and it was a lot of top military brass and um, foreign affairs officials and so forth. And in three days, I was about the only woman that was speaking. And I remember after I spoke, you know, talking about how we still need civil liberties in, uh, despite national, because of national security challenges, um, some very decorated uh, military brass came up to me afterwards and said, we bet that you feel very isolated here. And they, I knew they meant that I was the only civil liberties advocate. They had not even noticed. I said, yes, it is strange to be the only woman here. And they hadn't even noticed that. Um, the other thing that I and my female colleagues often remark about is that we are more prepared. Yeah. You know, I try to use my husband as a role model because he'll, he also does a lot of public speaking, and he'll, he'll wing it, you know, he, and he, he does fine. He does fine. He takes it all seriously, but he waits until the last minute, right? He, he writes out his, his notes for his talk on the plane, whereas I'm so well prepared. And my female colleagues, I think that's part of we feel we have to prove ourselves. We have to be sure to to be better than and better prepared. I'm going down the row here. I want answers. Um, okay, it's such a great question. And I think that sometimes there are two types of people. Like there are people who, you know, when they're going to a meeting, everyone's kind of afraid of, oh my God, this person's going to be at the table. And it could be a man or a woman. Or and then there are people that get underestimated. And a lot of women, I think, fall into the underestimated category, um, or as George Bush so said, misunderestimated, which is like mistakenly underestimated, I think. Um, and um, quite frankly, like I'm one of those people who was underestimated, um, definitely. Like when I began my organization, I remember I went to this one funder, and um, the funder said, Look, I think it's a great idea. Um, I just don't think a journalist can do this. And I was, I was after, it's like, there was such a terrible thing to say because is it really, he was against journalists doing this? Is that really what it was? I mean, and why did he have the need to put you so far down, you know, to, to do that? And um, it ended up literally, you know, years later that the president of his foundation was like, why aren't you being funded by us and ended up giving us an enormous amount from his presidential fund? I never said a word. Um, you know, that, that that happened. But that is, and why didn't I throw him under the bus? Because that's just not the way I want to be in the world. But I do think that 
if you are underestimated, in the end, you have a chance. The silver lining is of in which I mean, it is it sucks, right, to have someone say that to you. There is no silver lining. You have to work extra hard. You get you know muscly from get, pushing against the resistance so much. You have fire with your friends and your the pe- colleagues you work with because they're like, wow, we're going against all these people who think we can't do it. Um, you know, uh, you have a lot of psychological space because nobody thinks you can do it. Uh, but it, it, it's, it's hard every step of the way, you know? Yeah, so I think, you know, I would be remiss to not acknowledge that in so many ways, I think for me, starting out my career at this point, I am, and people of my generation are in a much better position in the legal profession than the women who came before us. You know, as an example, my all of the matters I'm working on at my firm right now, I report to a senior female partner who has brought along an incredible team of female junior partners, and, and there are often more women on her teams than men, but they're, you know, they're great teams, and she's a wonderful role model, and I'm clerking for two female judges in the next couple of years. So those opportunities and mentorships just weren't there before, and, I, and, and those have been very helpful. But I will say, I mean, I do think there are still a lot of ways in which um, it's difficult to be a woman, especially in litigation, for some of the reasons that Laurie mentioned. Um, I think the billable hour system at firms and the fact that women still have more responsibilities outside of work creates a difficult, uneven playing field to, to catch up to. There just are not enough hours in the day to bill as many hours as somebody who doesn't have any responsibilities at home. Um, and I think that's that along with the travel. Um, and as we've been seeing in the news, I think you know, sexual harassment is still an issue, very much so among a lot of my peers in politics, in law. So you know, I think it's important to acknowledge that, that things are still, you know, it's still an uphill battle in a lot of ways, but also that things are really getting better in a lot of ways as well. Lori. Uh, there's so much I want to say, so I'll make several points briefly. I mean, I mean first of all, I mean, things we're talking about, I realize, is what you call a first world problem. I mean, to, that, that women have come so far in this profession and there's a few ceilings that we haven't cracked. I mean, that pales in comparison when, when you see what's happening, you know, human trafficking or you see you know, sexual harassment at all levels of people at all levels in the workforce. So I recognize that. And, and I also was recently at a panel where several women of color were speaking and saying that all of the statistical diversity gains that have been made have been for white women and that they have not been equally shared among women who are diverse. And that's something also to keep in mind, that we have to think about every time we make gains for white women, we have to bring along the non-white women with them because they face, they face double barriers to the things that white women are facing. Um, I, think, I think what I have personally faced any sort of slight that is gender-based has been pretty benign, and I feel pretty grateful for that. Um, but I'll just give you one example. I was recently at a dinner, with a social dinner, and everyone there was, was your basic sort of professional, working in professional services, banking or law. And at some point, it's very New York. It always gets around to what do you do for a living? Maybe everyone asks that in every city, but New York people seem to really care what you do. <laughs> and, and a woman who had said, a woman who was at a, a very good law firm, uh, who went to Columbia Law School and was a lawyer, you know, said what she did. And she said, what do you do? And I said, I'm at Simpson Thatcher. And she just blurts out in front of everyone. She goes, oh, are you part-time? And, and she didn't ask. And I, and, I, and I responded very politely and kind of was about, and after my husband was like, you blew it. You should have just totally let that woman have it. And I said, no, no, I don't know her very well. I don't know how she's gonna, how she's gonna take that. But it's just interesting. And then it made me think. At least she said it, and I could say, no, no, actually, I'm a partner, and I run two groups, you know. And I, but I was very polite about it. But I think, think of all the people who aren't asking me, and just sort of assume, you know. And I mean, again, that's pretty benign. But I have a bunch of little things like that. Or when I was in a situation that was clearly business, and I was asking for business for my firm, and someone said to me, "Oh, I just thought you were being nice and friendly," and I was thinking, like, no, I paid with my corporate Amex, and if I were a man, you would have instantly known that I was taking you to lunch to discuss business. I mean, frankly, if I weren't, you'd be a little worried probably. <laughs> but, you know, the fact that, and I just think of all those little things. And again, this is a first world problem, and I'm not complaining, but when you say, are things still there? I mean, there are the things that are there. And it's not just tied to childcare, because if you factor out, uh, you know, women who are not married, women who do not have children, or women where their husband is providing the majority of the childcare, that doesn't equalize everything on levels of accomplishment. And and if that were the issue, then diverse men would be as far ahead as white men, and that's not true. So we definitely do have cultural things and things that we have to fix. But but I would say, like Nadine, I am an optimist too. And the way and and I'm just I'm just saying this because that was the question, and I'm not negative about this. 
And a friend of mine used the expression, she said, this is a great phrase, and she said, if you're a senior woman in your field, you have a constituency even if you didn't run for the office. And, and I really believe that. And I believe that, yeah. that the younger generation watches the people who are senior. And so, so we keep all of our little complaints to ourselves at the, you know, at the women-only events. And we you know, do our best to mentor and show the, the younger women that it's worth it because you know, it, we all got to get through the next few years and then, and then the years after that. And so I think it's important to focus on the positive because it will get better every generation. And so that's what we have to emphasize to the people behind us. What do you make, I promise to throw it open, I promise to, but I have a list. What do you make of the current climate, just the, before I ask uh, for other questions, of th this sort of spasm of sexual harassment and the Me Too movement? And, you know, we've seen these sort of conversations come and go before. You never know if it's going to be a rerun. Uh, I'm thinking back to Clarence Thomas. Uh, but uh, Catherine McKinnon is sort of wondering why this seems like the first time anybody ever has had a big nationwide conversation about sexual harassment. And I I'm trying to figure out, you know, or I imagine she is. I haven't asked her. Um, I'm trying to figure out what your reaction might be to this and how it might be affecting things in the profession at the moment. Is this a conversation that's happening in the law firms or in the, where you're working? Well I just want to say a quick point, because this is a, a huge problem and a much longer conversation, but I was struck by the fact, I mean, I, not that I pay attention to this before, but the Weinstein board was all male. The Uber board is all male, except for Ariana Huffington, and I think that the, she's a new addition. And you think about, I mean, it is a terrible problem, but you think about what's the quickest or one of the reasonable ways to fix it. And I mean, Anne's involved in this too, but like, I'm, you know, we need to see more women on corporate boards, and we need to see more women, you know, in the executive suite, because you just wonder in companies like that, I mean, maybe you can't control that there's some animal who thinks they can behave however they want because they have power, but you can control if people feel there's someone they can tell. And you just wonder, you just wonder how many companies where, where people don't think there's someone they could go to. And again, equality on paper, in theory, they should feel they could go to any senior male or senior female. But among all my friends who are senior females, they're the ones who get all these complaints. My senior male friends don't sit there and say, oh, the women come to me all the time and say that some client said something inappropriate. No, they go to senior women. And I just look forward to an era where we have so many senior women that, that people get busted much faster or people have deterrence much faster. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say, I mean, my, I think it's, an, it's been a really interesting moment. I've been thinking a lot about it. I think that for me, among my generation, the, the thing about the Weinstein scandal, if you will, that has been surprising to me has actually been the reaction to it and how shocked people seem to be. And that I think the Me Too campaign has been a, a bit more of, you know, I, I was always happy to talk about my experiences with this and have experienced it, and all of my friends have. But it, it, there was a sense that it was, ex, it was sort of known that this happens. And not that it was okay, but that this is not a surprise to me or any of my friends that these kinds of things happen in every industry. And I think that there was, among maybe the men of more of our generation, a bit of a, a shock that that this is so widespread and rampant, and so that in turn led to a lot of people talking more about, about it and just sharing more about it. Um, but I think that's been my experience, at least, is that I think you know, among my friends, we've all s shared stories of experiences with this, and I think maybe it, it hadn't really reached the wider male audience of our, our peers. When you share the stories, do you share strategies? I mean, I, I really want to get down to brass tacks here, but what do you, do you yeah. say, don't do this, do this, you, you know? Well, I think, you know, I actually, so after, after the Me Too campaign was starting on social media, I, um, I tweeted something about, you know, just a vague, like, uh, the, a couple of, pe like, instant examples, like a college professor. I had a, a sexual harassment experience with a college professor in college and then with a former U.S. senator. And I just tweeted that, basically. Somebody had said something like, which, hashtag, which time? And I said... <laughs> You know, and I listed that. And then um, I was contacted by a reporter from the Washington Post who wanted to ask me about the former U.S. senator. And the article actually just came out this morning, and I, 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 I saw it. But I, you know, I thought about it, and I was like, I'm actually, I'm happy to talk about what happened to me, and I have been, you know, to my friends and and to my peers. And I think not so much of strategies, but more. I heard the term whisper system, and I think there's more of a knowledge that this person, this employer, is, you know, I, in, the, in the article I explained that the, the term that was thrown around was, oh, he's handsy, you know, stay away from him. People would be warned. I was warned away from, you know, applying for jobs in this office or with this person. I think there's more of a sense of, 
knowing who is a problem and, and the, the, that spreading among my peers than so much and the strategy just being avoid those people, but not so much that people don't know that. People do know that. People senior in those offices know that. And so I think that's what I mean when I say that I'm surprised by how much people care, you know, that, that I think there is kind of a known, a known practice of it in, in every industry and certain people who are known to be problems. Okay, I will take questions. Make sure it is a question. Uh, yes, right there. Say who you are first, it will it'll help us. And I'm, I'm going to have to repeat the questions just because if we're being recorded, we can't hear you. So my question is, is, what do we have an obligation to do about this? So I know I'm a technical person, and I know that there's a senior person in my organization. And now, when I'm in a meeting, and I say something, and everybody ignores it, and then five minutes later, a man says the same thing, everyone says, oh, that's an interesting idea. I say, is there an echo in here? Oh. Is that what I just said? Or, <laughs> Okay, let me, let me stop you there and just uh, repeat and condense, which is, the question is, what should we do about this? And a couple of examples of, you know, people either repeating what the woman just said uh, or, and, and having to speak up and do something to call things when they happen. Um, what is, what, how, what's your response to that? Do you do that? Is that risky? Well, if, you have, if you're a tenured professor, presumably there are no risks. We have among the best job security in the world, but speaking from my experience, it is very hard to do for myself. Um, and I would say, you know, I've had the same kind of experience that you've had. Um, I will also raise it. So sexual harassment, I think we have made enormous progress in when I think of some horror stories that happened when I began practicing law and there were well-known examples of male um, partners harassing female associates and the associates were gotten rid of. I mean, that was just accepted. So, you know, two steps forward, one step back. So another issue that I'm very, very concerned about, including academia, is unequal compensation. Uh, there's still a very persistent pay gap, and um, it's 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 hard to it's hard to 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 speak up. Sometimes I will be very candid. I, I you know I'm known for being a very effective advocate, if I may say so, for other causes, but for myself, it's much harder. Course. Yeah. And we care about relationships. Other, we other care questions. About relationships. Yes, thank you. So, so that's a perfect segue. I'm Ann Weisberg, uh, class of 85. Oh. And, um, uh, you know, and even in the context of sexual harassment, the EEOC put out a report on sexual harassment last year that basically concludes that it has made no difference. Um, and the only thing that they point to as having made a difference is what we what's called in my world bystander training. So this whole idea of creating allies, right? So um, just so that you all know, uh, we, uh, the WLA, the Women's Law Association, here at Harvard Law School last week launched a men's gender allies group. And this is something that's become a movement on the business school campuses. And I would love to hear you <coughs> I, I, uh, let me just quickly condense this good question, which is basically um, about male allies and creating and, and um, uh, relying on male allies. Um, I want to point out, I, just because the opportunity arises, that I have a male ally in the room whose name is Bill Riley, who is the former administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency in the George H.W. Bush era. And he is largely responsible for my being on a corporate board uh, because he made that opportunity available to me. And so I have, just want to call you out, Bill, for this good deed that you uh, have done. Uh, <laughs> but, but they exist, you know, I, I know, and we all know, and I know you're saying they do, and I, it's a wonderful question. As a, yeah. And so, so what about it? I mean, I think you have to, you know them when you see them, right? I mean, you, there's always, you, 
um, there are different ways that different people are on the lookout for them. I mean, I'll say in my firm, I mean, we have a, a women's committee that is, we have a women's advisory group that's associates, and then we have a women's committee that is just partners. And it's mostly women partners, but we decided we founded this like in 2008 that we wanted men on the committee. And, it, and all the women partners got together and decided which men we wanted to invite. It was one of the most <laughs> hilarious and unrepeatable and totally true conversations I think I've had in a long time. But, but we all picked the same men, and like we knew. And, and, and actually, it, maybe it's a coincidence, all five of those men had incredibly brilliant and accomplished wives. So we figured we would get a two for one, that they would go home and say, I heard this in the women's committee, yeah. and their wife would be like, damn straight. You know, <laughs> and like you know, and, and agree with us. So, like you know who they are in the organization, and, and and you do need to draw them into the conversation. And these these men have been very helpful in the women's initiative in my firm. And I also say one thing for progress is is even some of the men who I I think they're thinking, you know, may have been a little old fashioned, shall we say? Like if if they have daughters, exactly. as their daughters grow up, it totally yeah. changes them. I mean, there there are people who are walking their daughters' kids to school because their daughters work, and like it just totally changes. And that's also a way to open the conversation. Like if you say something happened, you said, well, how would you, you know, your daughter's in the workforce. How would you feel if this happened to her? And like you sort of phrase it like that and they, they it humanizes them and it sees their point of view. So I think you've got to look for the people, but there will be more of them. If I can say, you know, putting on my constitutional law professor hat, Sandra Day O'Connor uh, made this observation. Some of you may remember that um, then, I think it was before he was Chief Justice, William Rehnquist had initially for a long time voted not to strongly enforce the equal protection clause against gender discrimination and he flipped and when she explained why he flipped she said it was because his daughter was old enough that she was experiencing gender discrimination in the workforce I must say I find this intensely frustrating when I hear stories like this do you remember when the Trump tape came out um, and all the politicians all the male politicians went on television and said I'm married I love my mother I have a daughter and I thought what is wrong with you that you need to have a female connection in the world to understand that this is wrong but I think you're suggesting that it really is it does make a difference if they have it close to them in their own family I, I, I find that astonishing well, you know, as they say, that so many people only became sensitive to uh, equal rights concerns for sexual orientation minorities yeah. if they realized that somebody they knew was an LGBT yes. person. More from you all. Yes, Maria. I'm, I'm actually curious about the class that you mentioned. This, uh, oh, and oh Allie, you want to? Mm -hmm. Is that? Just how, okay, yeah. <laughs> so the question is just about this class, Women and Ambition, and, and uh, what was it about, Allie? Yeah, so it was a, a reading group, I think, technically, um, led it by... Became, it became a class. Oh, it did? Okay. So I think my year was the experimental yes. reading group year, it but um, it was led by Professor Freeman and by Dean Claypool, and um, I think it, there was an application where you wrote a little essay about why you were interested in, in joining the group, and it was really a place to talk about the books like Lean In and Anne-Marie Slaughter's article about why women still can't have it all and really just to have a space to talk about not so much, I think the idea was most of the people in the room were very ambitious but were running up against some of the double bind issues or how to, how to navigate managing being assertive with being likable and um, we just, we read a lot and we heard a lot from Professor Freeman and Dean Claypool which was the best part of the class to hear from two people who'd made it to the top of academia, which I think is in the law is a field where um, you've had a lot of experiences that were really helpful to share and just to talk about kind of how to navigate those issues. And it was my favorite class while at Harvard and I think issues that I had been thinking a lot about, but not so much in the context of the legal profession. So it was a bit of more of a focus on that. Back there, I can't quite see you. Yes. The, the question is, what is it going to take to have a woman president in the United States? We see many women leaders around the world, but not here at home. Public opinion surveys indicate that people in the abstract uh, would vote for a woman, but I don't know. Maybe they're lying to pollsters. I don't know. So, I mean, I've obviously been thinking a lot about this question <laughs> since the election, and I think one thing that struck me about the criticism that Hillary Clinton received was 
especially among my my peers, was that she just seemed too calculating. She seemed too um, trying to say what people wanted to hear. And to me, that just struck me so much after having been in this reading group in particular as a symptom of how uh, of, of her generation and being one of the first women in the spotlight and being criticized for many things that came out of her mouth. And then the contrast of Trump, who says whatever pops into his head, and people responded to that in a really positive way, because I think they saw it as truth telling and they saw it as not politics as usual. And so my one thing I reflected on is I think more women, you know, feeling comfortable to just speak like that and not go through so much, you know, maybe over preparation, like Hillary Clinton was often over prepared and people didn't really like that. You know, it seemed it seemed calculating. And so one thing I'm hopeful of is just more, you know, as women make it to the top of more careers and in politics, that there'll be more of a, a comfort level with just speaking your mind and speaking your truth. And that I think that appeals to voters and maybe in turn that will help. Last week, I mean, this is such a coincidence. Last week I spoke at Yale Law School because the Yale Law women felt motivated to have a year-long speaker series of women who have succeeded in the profession. They, they are hungering for role models and the same kind of questioning here. And to prepare for that, uh, I reread a speech that Hillary Clinton had given at a graduation there before she ran for president. Um, but I think she was already in the Senate. And it was tongue in cheek, but it was rather serious. Um, she was talking about what m women of Yale Law School pay attention to your hair, because that's what the public is going to pay attention to. That's what the press is going to pay attention to. And, you know, there is all this coverage of what we think should be irrelevant and not enough attention to what should be relevant. I think, I mean, I think we are a very superficial country. We have a big celebrity <laughs> culture. I mean, it's not that everybody else doesn't like celebrities, but you look at the physicality of female leaders, you know, in other countries, and you just, you just know if they ran in the U.S., they would be excoriated for it. But, I mean, not to say the glass is half full, but Hillary did get very close. I mean, look at the popular vote, and she did run with a lot of baggage. And, and maybe, you know, the first person knocks on the door but doesn't kick it in. And so the next person... Who, and there are a lot of women who do have her credentials who don't have her baggage. And so I don't, I don't think we've totally lost that battle. Yes, Rupa. Having been a uh, physician of leadership, do you have advice on how to deal with people, especially men within the organization, who might resist or resent your authority? Do you ever feel yourself going, maybe I'm too nice, maybe I need to take on a tougher or harder stance just to deal with it, even if it goes against? So the really good question. The, the question is, um, how do you deal in being in positions of authority in your organizations with men who may resist or have difficulty with your leadership? And do you ever feel like you're being too nice and maybe should be a little tougher? I mean, everybody deals with that. I mean, I think I think almost every women's business leadership book has has some take on that and dealt with that. There's there's an old Southern saying that says, when you go to the party, you dance with the one who brought you. And I think. I think you can't mutate your personality into something you're not over time. And so, I mean, if you are a nice person, I think it's really exhausting to try to, you know, put on a, a suit of armor that isn't your personality. I think you have to work with what your personality is. And, and, and you are going to have those moments. And so you pick and choose the time. If you are a nice person, you'll see. There'll be times when you're so annoyed that you won't be nice and you'll, and you'll rise to the occasion. And so I, I think... Um, I, th I think that is something that everybody deals with every day and everyone second guesses themselves and you just have to just, just get through the day and just, you, you know, be yourself. Amy, we that's haven't really heard good advice. Be yourself, be yourself. I mean, that's, there's no other way to do it because there will be a moment where people will be surprised by how tough you are. <laughs> you know, they'll just be like, you got rid of that person? You fired him? And it's just like, that's right because it was the right thing to do. You know, and, and, and I think... I, and I think you have to be curious if you're curious. You have to be kind and be excellent and be all those things that you are. And, and eventually it's, you know, maybe what was you're saying about Hillary, an authenticity. And by that I mean a consistency, a, uh, you know, a coherence, something that it's your integrity. That's what it is. It's, and it's you're consistent throughout. And that's what, what it, it, in the end, will 
really come out and, and it's all you'll be left with, you know, true in the end. I, I want to ask you a question about both having bosses and being bosses. Uh, how to be a good boss and how, how to deal with a bad one. Um, so I, I, can, can we get some advice on that? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm reeling back to an experience I had when I was, uh, was even before I entered law school between the, the summer between graduating from college and starting law school. I was working as a paralegal in a Boston law firm. And one of the most important experiences that I, I tell everybody who works for me when they make a mistake, because I made a mistake. And the partner, I mean, it didn't have horrible consequences, but it was a mistake. And the partner, I thought, handled it so well. He just noted the fact, and he didn't even say, that's bad. He noted it, and he went on, and I thought, you know, I learned the lesson from that. He didn't need to beat me over the head about it. And so when I have um, people who are working for me, it's now it's mostly student research assistants, and they want to abjectly apologize, I always say no, and I tell them that story. You know, I will accept one apology as long as I know that you have learned a lesson from this. And I really learned a lesson from that, right? It made me extra careful about avoiding that kind of mistake. So I'd say my teaching role and my boss role kind of meld together. What is an effective way of teaching a lesson that will be constructive and not make that person feel bad about himself or herself, but this is a learning opportunity. In terms of firing, I think the only way that I can do it, um, because it does go against my being a nice, kind, forgiving person, is when it reaches the point that I know that not firing that person is making life really hard for other people, <laughs> not just me, yeah. but other employees. Yeah. So yeah. You're, you're not really being kind by, by keeping on dead weight. I, I also think as, like, you know, as I'm a boss now, but I have people in my organization who are a check on me, and I count on them to say to me, I think you're being unfair in this situation. I count on them, you know, I have this one woman who is director of operations and every morning at 7.20 when her kid is on the bus and my kid is on the bus, we usually talk for an hour. Sometimes we go, I, I go running and we talk and she'll be on her exercise machine and we go through like what we have to do for the day and also th t things that we were, were struggling with or unsure about. And you need to have somebody like that, just like in your lives, like you hopefully, you know, there's someone, uh, a, a spouse or a, a colleague or a friend who can check on you and you can just throw something up and be like, does this make sense to you? You need that. That's like a crucial thing, I think, for being a boss um, um, because they can see things that we just all can't see ourselves perfectly. Yeah, I would add to also related to the question about male allies earlier that I've had some really incredible male bosses, especially in politics and early in my career. And I think what made them such great bosses was that they they just gave me opportunities. They would put me in a room. They would give me a task or an opportunity that I didn't think I was ready for. And, and they would just say, you're fine. You'll be fine. Just do it. And I think that um, the people who are willing to let go a little bit and, and give that back. And, and I, you know, I've tried to do that for people who have been on my teams and recognize when I don't need to do something myself and it would be a good experience for somebody else. And I think especially men uh, have an ability to do that and people accept it and can bring women up along with them in that way. And, and I, I totally agree with what she said. And I, and I would say that... Um, you have to manage your bosses, and I think this is particularly saying to the young women in this room, is there might, there might be all sorts of assumptions. Again, we're all equal on paper, but there is sort of an assumption, in fact, for most women that push comes to shove, they're not sure if you're as ambitious as the rest of the men. And so you have to just sort of put that on the table that you are, and you have to ask them for the stretch opportunity, and you have to present it. I mean, I mean, that is, I mean, obviously you perform very well in stretch opportunities. Some maybe you asked for, and some, like you say, they just gave them to you. But if you don't say anything, they're probably not gonna give them to you 50-50 with the guys. So you have to make it clear that you're on the team. I'll give you an example. A friend of mine who had a baby and came back to, not my firm, a different firm, different city, and, and she noticed like she was getting work that didn't seem as time sensitive and didn't seem as interesting. And she thought she was imagining it. And then she realized, 
she probably wasn't. And she just went into her boss and said, look, why am I not getting as good work since I have the kid? I am just as motivated. I don't want to quit because I had this kid. I love this job. I want the real work. And she just, and then they had a very frank conversation. But I think, you know, People are terrified of having that conversation. They don't know exactly what's legal. They don't want to upset you. They don't want to get written up in the NALP guide that they're a horrible, family unfriendly firm. But well, you know, if you push and have the conversation, people will tell you the truth. You know, and so I think you have to manage. You have to manage your bosses and make sure they're giving you what you want. Yes. This is a question from someone who is an LLM student here from Israel who says that the conversation uh, with her friends and colleagues in Israel is that um, the equal opportunity stops once women become mothers. And can, can you guys comment on that? And co-authored a book about this, but that was many years ago. I, th I assume things have changed dramatically since then. Well, no, actually, the pay gap that you talk about yeah. is actually a material yes. And said the pay gap is uh, basically a, a, about kids uh, more than gender. But a, any reflection on your observations about this? I mean, I would say, I mean, just, you know, for managing your own situation, you know, when I, th I think, like I said, I think you have to have that conversation. I mean, I mean, ideally, you should have it with men and women when they come back from parental leave. And ideally, the men in your organization are taking just as much parental leave as the women are taking. Anecdotally, I don't think that's true. On paper, it's true. But I have, I have a lot of women who work for me, and many of whom are on a flexible arrangement. And, and I sort of learned the hard way on this, that not saying anything and sort of presuming you know what people want, you could be wrong, and that's just a disservice to everyone. And so I have the conversation. If someone says they want flexible time, I said, okay, there's different ways you can do this. I said, if you want to keep up with your class, this is the way that you should do it. You know, you should do this kind of work, and I'll give you less of it. You know, I said, if you need a few months to get on your feet, you know, and you want less time-consuming work, but then you want to go for it, I said, but you think about what you want, and I give them a bunch of different options, and we have the frank conversation. I mean, Sheryl Sandberg has said, it's either in Lean In, or she said this in one of her speeches, that it's not illegal to discuss pregnancy and kids. It's illegal to discriminate against people for, for babies and kids, and, and people are so afraid of that being conflated that no one even has the conversation. But not only is that conversation not illegal, but, but it's very necessary. And ideally, you should have it with a returning dad, but I think, I think you have to be frank because you just have to say, look, I, I'll just give you one example. A friend of mine who was a partner in another firm, um, this is a great story. He got this case, a career-making case. Like whoever was going to be the senior associate on this case was probably going to make partner for it. And this woman had just come back from maternity leave, and she was really the best person for the job. And he said to her, I want you to do this case. You will probably make partner. It's a lot of travel. You're going to have to pump and fed, you know, the whole bit, you know, but I'm not going to, I didn't want to make that decision for you and just assume you didn't want it. I want you to make that decision. And, and so you let me know if you want on this case. And he said that he got yelled at by a lot of women in his firm. And I think he was absolutely correct not to censor her job. And she took it and she took the job and she fed extra breast milk and she made partners. So I think you have to, you, you have to make sure that you know that you're still that they know that you're still in the game yeah. others yes right here in the front So this question is about uh, making decisions about when to call people out on things, when to take on extra work. It's sort of picking your battles kind of question. We've all picked our battles. I know it. So, I'm sure yeah. Not, I mean, one that's thing that I thought a lot about that you said in our reading group was uh -oh. you described <laughs> you described the droplets of energy that women. <laughs> shed every day thinking about Waste, yeah. you, wasted, dro wasted droplets is my wasted phrase droplets yes and whether that's w what do I wear because men have a suit uniform and women kind of have to read every situation differently or whether it's you know I find myself s spinning my wheels over is this the thing to say or not and so I don't have a great answer to that the broader picking your battles question but I have tried to get better about not 
deciding quickly whether I'm going to use my droplets towards something or not and letting go of things that, you know, are just going to take up time and ultimately that are not worth it. I can just echo something that Amy said, which is I think to some extent you have to go with your gut. I mean, because sometimes you would just feel so strongly that you will be denying your identity and your integrity if you don't pursue it. But I still think it's good to check with somebody else whose judgment you trust. <laughs> so, you know, it has to be, you have to have both. I, I think I would say you need to have subjective really strong motivation, but somebody who's a little bit more distant and can give you the objective, reasonable person second guessing. There's a cost to, you're talking about cost and um, not doing everything really costly all the time. And it's a calibrated calculation around what's the benefit for this amount of cost, you know? And if I intervene now, have I done my one intervention and I can't get it back? And you have to kind of make these decisions. But I, I have to say, I highly recommend humor. Uh, they'll get the point. You know, you can lightly make clear. You know, I've, my first meeting on the board that I referenced, um, you know, Fortune 50 board, uh, big, you know, big market cap company at the first cocktail party, and I happened to be uh, in a pantsuit, and one of the other male members of the board asked me to get him a drink because he thought I was a server, and I was on his board. <laughs> so I got him his drink, oh. brought it back, and said, here you go, and he realized once I delivered the drink what a terrible mistake he made, and I just tapped him on the shoulder and said, it's no problem at all. You know, it just, just, you know, he got it, right? But <laughs> you just, you don't always have to come at it one yeah. way. Other things. Uh, I've got to be nice in the back. I haven't been very distributive. <laughs> on the edge there in the third row. This question is really about how to find the right balance between all the things pulling at you as a woman in professional life who has home responsibilities too. I'll say a friend of mine once said there are three things that you know are women's jobs. You have work, you have family, and you have household administration. And if you are a perfectionist, you can only choose two out of three. Mm -hmm. So if you don't want to choose two out of three, you have to drop the perfectionism. I mean, so, you know, if, if the house is a mess, so what? You know, and if you were the last person to turn in the permission slip, I mean, I, again, these are first world problems. But I, I do think, I would say some of my friends now who are not in the paid labor force, who are incredibly talented women, I think it was hard on them that, you know, we all got to Harvard Law School because we got an A-plus every time, and you can't get an A-plus in every sphere, and so you gotta, you got to be willing to take a couple Bs in some areas of your life, and so my apartment is a B on good days, you know, <laughs> so, so, I mean, I, I know that sounds like a simplistic answer, and I don't, I don't mean it to be, but you'll, you'll never have balance every day, like, you'll never have every day that you've got the perfect amount of exercise, the perfect amount of sleep, the perfect amount of family time, like, you have to just think, okay, so these are the few days that I really get the A-plus because I've got a brief due, and and my house is a wet mess, and I had somebody else help my kid with my homework, and I would have done a better job. And then you switch over, and on the weekend, you know, so, you know, over the course of a year, you, you got to feel like it's all working for you, but you're never going to have the right balance every single day, and you just, you just have to realize, like, that's okay. And I think you can, um, in a very similar spirit, cut things that are inessential. Um, one of the things that just absolutely keeps me going, and it's sort of like counterintuitive because the more, the harder I'm working, the more I absolutely need friends and conversation, and to me, the, 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 the best energizing and uh, rejuvenating and life-affirming experience is having dinner with friends and having them to my home. So, <laughs> and my husband, we share that. 
Yesterday, I testified, I went to Washington, I live in New York, I went to Washington and back to testify before the United States Senate, and this morning I came here, um, and last night I had 16 people to my apartment for dinner. <laughs> um, and it, but here's the way we do it. We order in food from a local delicatessen, we use plastic plates, and, um, and, and you know, it's not, my mother would never have done this. <laughs> and people are so grateful, and they're all very, very busy people, too. And it's so, and, and every time we do this, we always, my husband and I always debrief, what could we eliminate? What stip could we eliminate so that we can really <laughs> enjoy it? And people are not coming here for the, for the fancy plates or fancy food. They're coming to be together. And so you look at what you can't, you know, and the house wasn't so clean either. Right. <laughs> but the food was sanitary. <laughs> Sometimes, like, it's, it's 9 o'clock at night, my husband's sleeping, my child's snoring, and the dishwasher is buzzing. And I'm there working until, like, 1 o'clock in the morning. And then what I realize when I start emailing my colleagues is that they're working at 1 o'clock in the morning, too. <laughs> like, we all work all the time, you know, it really late at night. And we do it because like, I leave work at 4.30 because I want to take him to swim practice. I want to take my 10-year-old to swim practice. So I leave work, and then I work the entire time I'm there, and I feel like I'm constantly trying to play catch-up. But isn't this a great first-world problem to have? Because I love my work. You know, I love it, and I, and I can play in my mind with things when I'm sitting there and watching football, and it's, like, totally boring, and I'm thinking about a problem in my head. You know what I'm saying? Like, aren't we the lucky ones that we get to do this work? You know, that's what I try and tell myself when um, I'm like, why do they get to snore, and I'm here? <laughs> you know? This is a good right problem. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Th this question's about um, how to handle the fact that women are sometimes harder on women and um, are blockers actually in, in to your advancement. Great question. That's not. A <laughs> That's tough. I mean, uh, I think this goes a little bit to what I was saying earlier about good good male bosses, and I think that. What I've seen so far with some of the women that I've worked with in, in law is that not so much that they're being harder on me because I'm a woman, but because they had to work harder and be more thorough and do everything right to get where they are. And so that is how they operate, and it's how they teach me to operate, which is, you know, you can't cut a corner. And sometimes that feels like a huge burden because I feel like there's a simpler way to do it and they're not as open to that as maybe a, a male boss would be. And so I think, you know, I think a part of it is recognizing that that, that maybe is part of what's going on and also for women as we are in positions of uh, delegating or managing other projects to realize that maybe maybe it doesn't have to be done the way we've done it before and to also feel more comfortable with um, a mistake being made and, and taking responsibility for that. I find, my, I find my male bosses just don't worry about that as much. If something gets messed up, they can explain it to the client and they're just not as concerned. And I think, so I think it, it, it's all sort of related. Robert. This, this was just a comment showing that... that uh, Women should support each other. They shouldn't be against each other. I, I will say, just again, equality on paper and what's happening is I think we are more prompt to beat ourselves up over the different choices that we have. And, and you don't know what issues are going on with everybody internally, and I think that gets acted out on. I mean, we, people make value judgments on what they've missed and given up on their own life. People have petty jealousies, male or female, but there's just a particular female flavor, I think, of how that how that can get played out, like what people think is the right amount of time you should spend with their kids, what people feel they've had to give up and why should you have it all when I didn't. I mean, again, we're optimists and that gets better every time, but that, that's certainly out there. And 
I, I think all you can do, I mean, you, you, you run your own show now. It's a, you just have to double down and be out there uh, and you just have to double down and do your part to promote other women. Like I think Madeline Albright has said there's a special place in hell for women who don't help other women. And if you're in a position, I mean, like for instance, I did not know that Jody was on a board and I, I actually work with a lot of people to place women on boards. And now that I know she and I are going to talk about this after are we? this session, but if you <laughs> no, but I mean, if you know qualified women to recommend for things or women to promote, I mean, you, I mean, that is an active part of what I sit there and think about every day, every opportunity I hear of. I mean, obviously if I don't know a qualified woman, that's one thing, but I think there are a lot of qualified women out there who are getting overlooked and so I think I think you just have to double down you know on thinking of that just to, to make up for the fact that there are other people out there who aren't doing it uh, wow this row is really active hang on yes I'll come back I promise mm -hmm. Nanette yes I'm embarrassed to say I don't know the answer to that question, but I, I can tell. Has it, has it increased? Yes, I can tell you that we've become an increasing. The question was about women of color and the percentage of the class. Um, we have become an increasingly diverse law school, absolutely without question. I don't have a number for you, though. I, I would like to know if there are efforts, um, you know, like well thought about efforts to bring more as, as a faculty, as a. Not. Yes, I just, I, 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 absolutely. This has been a focus, and I think you all can report on this, having and, been and, at the law school. I would like to extend this to the workplace of each one of you. Yeah. So if there's any effort that you've seen to bring more women of color, because, of course, we all have tons of women, but the ones that have of color have a second or third. So yeah. This is a question about efforts being made in particular to advance women of color. I mean, so, I remember when I was a student here, and even after I graduated, Derek Bell, who was um, the only, he may have even been the only African-American male faculty member, or certainly the first, and he kept saying, you know, we have, we have to have at least one. I mean, that sounds so little now, <laughs> but I remember that was so dramatic, and he actually resigned from the Harvard Law School faculty over that and went to NYU instead, and then Lonnie Guineer became the first, and now I hope there are more than I can even think yes. of. And, and we're certainly, I, I, I'd say this is a great concern to all law school faculties. We, we still have a real challenge in that regard. Women of color, women period, you know, the truth is we haven't busted, uh, I don't think we're, we're easily not above 25% of the tenured faculty. I'm one of the few senior women still to this day, uh, relatively speaking, and presumably academia is supposed to be easier to crack uh, than the profession, um, and certainly on a campus like Harvard, you would think it's even harder in the sciences, which it turns out to be, and yet still at the law school where we have a ceiling. So there's, there are miles to go here, but I just want to remind you of something Drew Faust said the other night at Sanders Theater as part of the opening gala for our bicentennial. She said, we, we celebrate Harvard Law School, not just because it got older, not because we're hitting the 200-year mark, but really for getting closer. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought that was really a beautiful way to put it. Uh, let me, let me, I have to distribute. I have to distribute. Oh, I know. It, it, uh, David Wilkins has been studying this. He's just been yes. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, I'm pointing at you. Yes. Sorry, second row. Was your hand up? Yes. yes. OK. Um, so before we touched on whether women bosses are harder than uh, you know, harder their female subordinates uh, and male bosses, and I'm just wondering if there's actually been studies of that, or is that our own sexist ideas of you know, maybe we see powerful women in a harder That's life, and so we're perceiving things in a more critical way. We're taking things in a more Yeah. I, I just wonder about the truth of the 
this is a follow-up on whether it's really true that women bosses are somehow harder on, on women, whether we've studied it or we know. Any reflection on that? And I, I don't know about the studies. I think you're on to something. I mean, I'll say in my, in my career coming up, I worked for a lot of women that people would warn me they were difficult, you know, and difficult is always said in this hushed whisper, you know, like it's a disease or something. And, and I, never, I never saw what the problem was, you know, and I've been across the table from women who I'm told were difficult and scary, and I, and I never saw it. So I always take that with a grain of salt, because I, I do think there is a double standard on terms of, you know, if a deadline is missed, are you allowed to get, you know, is, is any family-related excuse fair game just because your boss is a woman who has kids? I mean, I think I've had this conversation with female colleagues of mine and, and male colleagues, and and the male colleagues are, have never heard some of the excuses that that some of us have heard. You know, they, if they've got some sort of family issue, they just somehow manage to get the brief in if it's a male boss, but a female boss... The, the, I'm, not, I'm saying that happens all the time, but again, it's not entirely equal on paper. So I, I do think you're on to something. I mean, you talk about things like petty jealousies. I, mean, I, don't, I don't know that women are any more jealous, but, you know, petty is not mm-hmm. the worst. But mm-hmm. I just think that you have to be careful about mm-hmm. the way they phrase things. Mm-hmm. So. No, I, the one study I, I do know of is, uh, to your point, which is something we talked about in our reading group, which probably folks are familiar with, but there was a Harvard Business School study where They described a boss who was tough and demanding, um, but really top of their field and a whole narrative. And in in one version, the boss was called Harold and the other, the boss was called Heidi. And everyone said, Harold sounds like a great boss. I want to work for him. He's, you know, he's tough, but it's fair. And, and with Heidi, everybody said, oh no, she sounds terrible. She's so demanding. So there definitely is, is that dynamic. Um, And I think that's something to be aware of for sure. At the very end, on the second row. The question is about initiatives or um, efforts that you guys are involved in to change the structural obstacles, not just these sort of our individual situations. Nadine? Well, you know, the ACLU Women's Rights Project is still cracking and still has work to do all these decades after um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was the founding director. And in some ways, the work is so much harder now because uh, precisely because you have picked off the low-hanging fruit, right? And... um, Lenore White, Lenore, Lenore, I'm sorry, I'm blanking out on her last name, who's the um, uh, executive director of that project, has folk, I know that sexual harassment in the workplace is a is a big focus of the work. Um, work, she, a very, very big focus is women of color uh, because all of the metrics show that their obstacles are, are much greater. But, you know, it's there aren't so many big blockbusting constitutional law cases that you can bring anymore. Um, so I, I apologize I, 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 that I don't know the details. You should p- look at the website of the ACLU Women's Rights Project. I know it's got you know their latest cases, their advocacy for, uh, litiga- for legislative reform at both the state level and the national level. Uh, and there are some other organizations that they collaborate with, um, the National Women's Law Center in Washington, D.C., the National Organization for Women. I mean, I personally, I know not everybody agrees with this, think that reproductive freedom is an essential element of women's equality, and, uh, and San- no less significant a person than Sandra Day O'Connor uh, thought that and said it in uh, a major Supreme Court case, and you know, we're still struggling on that front enormously, and um, so there's a lot of work being done. Sorry, I don't know all the details. Uh, we have to wrap it up shortly, so I'll, actually I'll take one more right here, and then um, we'll, we'll close it.
this question is just about women, uh, the, whether there's a women's network, an old women's network, instead of the old boys' network, and, and how you help other women give them, give them work. I, I think there have been a lot of women who have been enormously helpful to me, and I hope that I've done the reverse. That I mean, the factual issue is there's fewer of us. So, you, you, you know, there's, even if all your women friends are out there pulling for you, that's going to be fewer people in the network than men are. So I think it's just another call to arms that we all have to double down on that front. But I, I, I think there are many women out there I'm enormously grateful to, and I, and I hope that I can pay it forward. Yeah, I, I can't really say enough about my women friends. I mean, these are people who are in my mind's eye. They're successful women. As I'm doing something that I feel like, oh, my God, I shouldn't be doing this. And I think about them, like people who are in my mind are the people who are who have done more than I have. And I think about them and how they think of things. And then I call them. I think you talked about this a little bit. You've that kind of mentorship from successful women, it's like, and what's beautiful about it is when you get together and you can just kind of go, there are different tracks to your life, right? You've got your work track and your home track and your love track and your husband track, and you can go in between these tracks so quickly, you know, one, two, 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 and that's, and that's the best, you know, and that's, you've got to find those people and hold them dear because those are the people that will get you through in the end. Um, I'm going to wind this up and let you have at the panel individually. If people want to ask you questions, will you hang out for just a few more minutes? But before I do that, I want to ask one question that's on my mind, which is, is there something that's changed for you over time as you've gotten older? Some of us are older than others on this panel. But is there something that's, that's shifted, that's changed, that is a quality that you think has become more important to you and to your success over time? Uh, mine is, I used to be much harder uh, on everyone, <laughs> including my students, and they would they thought I was really a hard ass, you know, and I'm way softer and puffy and stuff now. <laughs> so what I, I don't know I, what I happened. Can't but you said that because that was exactly what yeah. I was going to say. Mm -hmm. uh, and, seriously, and, um, and and I was thinking about it, but you still, even wearing the kindness mode can still. So I'm always being more constructive and bending over backwards to be nice to people because I think it reminds me of that old Aesop's fable about this, the, the sun and the wind, right? That the sun was a, won the bet with the wind about which one could get the guy, the traveler, to take his cloak off. And so the wind is blowing and blowing, and the traveler wraps it around himself. But the sun, you know, makes persuades him to take his cloak <laughs> off. And i i and it, at first, I think when I was younger, I felt I had to show my tough, strict self. Uh, now I feel that I'm so empowered that I can do it in a kind way, and it's much more effective, and it's so much more satisfying and humanizing to know that you're being kind to people, but also helping them and also helping them I, I think say. just I completely agree with that but I also think like as I've gotten older like I so if someone asks me for help or someone wrote me this morning and said can I have a recommendation I've only talked to her for an hour on the phone I you know shot off I do it I, sh I try and help everybody but sometimes there's somebody that comes along mm -hmm. and I'm like this person is so extraordinary and I will like spend Days editing their essays. I mean, I will. There's a few people that I'll just reach out because so many people did it for me. You know, I feel like I have to pay it forward. So I feel like it's really finding people that you that you can really bet on, and then saying, okay, I'm, I'm because I know that I can really help this person. You were at a disadvantage here, Ellie. But there well, no, I was going to say I actually was soaking in everything Lori was saying about perfectionism because this is something I'm realizing early on in my career is <laughs> I am a perfectionist and I want to have the nice plates at my dinner party and I want my house to be perfect and I don't have any kids and I'm realizing that I can't fit everything into my day already and I'm, I'm wondering how do you ever create room for... And I'm not doing a lot of the things I'd like to do, like hobbies. And so I think, you know, that's a work in progress for me. But I can see that if you're if I'm going to keep in this profession, it's going to be necessary to start letting some things go. So I'll be working on that.
And Laura, you get the last word. Uh, it, it's the same point. I think I'm, in, in my own hyper way, I am more relaxed, you know? I mean, I think, I think I get a lot more done, but I'm not internally sweating the little things. Like when you're junior, you feel like you cannot make a mistake, and you cannot make a mistake. And you get older, and you realize you simply cannot go through life without making a mistake. And you realize, like, whatever mistakes you have, they're, they're, you know, we're not doctors. We can't kill anybody, you know? So it's, you know, any mistake you make, you, you can probably fix it, and you, get, and you get past that. And I think when you sort of get that, that attitude just sort of permeates. And, and that goes not just to your work life, but just, you know, to your home life. I mean, like, unless you leave your kid out in the middle of the street in, in front of moving traffic, like, you probably can't make a terrible motherhood mistake either. And so I think you just get to the point that you get a lot more efficient at getting stuff done because you're not spending all that time debriefing and second-guessing yourself. Um, I, I'm going to let Maria make one announcement, and then I'm going to thank all of our panelists. Um, Maria? Yeah, so real quick. So my name's Maria Stern, class of 2002, and I am the president of the Harvard Law School Women's Alliance which if you haven't heard what it is, it is the largest alumni group of Harvard Law School Association. And our mission lines up perfectly with what these amazing panelists spoke about today, which is the advancement of women into positions of power and leadership and how we can help see that happen. So we have the WLA for the folks here at, at the law school, and then we are your natural stepping stone afterwards. So if you want information, I've got, we've got flyers, and that's all I wanted to share. Um, Lori and Allie and Amy and Nadine, thank you so much for thank coming you. and doing this, and thank you for coming. <laughs>